All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at least everyone on the East Coast. Brandon Gare with the National Minority Quality Forum here. We have another um, one of our Friday webinars, and I'm pleased, especially pleased on this one because it's not only it's always hosted by um, the incomparable Mia Keys, but it's featuring my boss, Dr. Gary Puckrin. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mia. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Brandon, thank you so much for having us on today. We're really excited to be featuring uh, none other than Dr. Gary Puckerin, President and CEO of the National Minority Quality Forum. And if you know anything about Dr. Puckerin, you know you're quite you're very much in for for uh, not only serious um, information with respect to the moment today, but he's going to take us back. He's going to take us forward with respect to how we need to how we how we've been uh, how where how this present moment has been informed by the past and and how we need to leverage this moment and really think and reframe uh, uh, how we approach health systems and health systems thinking moving forward. So without further ado, Dr. Puckett, I'm going to turn it over to you for our open, and then we're going to go ahead and get into a conversation. And audience members, as always, should you have questions, please place your questions in the question and answer box, not in the chat box, in the question and answer box. All right? So Dr. Puckett, thank you so much for lending us some time today, sir. I'll turn it over to you. You know, thank you, Mia. I always enjoy having conversations with you. Um, we share a kindred spirit in believing that uh, you have to understand your history if you're going to figure out um, where you're going. I just want to take a, a few moments, and then what I'm really looking forward uh, to this afternoon is a, is a dialogue, uh, not just with us, but with those who are um, um, uh, uh, you know, attending and, and participating uh, in the uh, in the webinar, um, what, what I want to introduce you to is the idea of moving away from a conversation about health disparities and really talking about controlling health outcomes. So as we move deeper into the 21st century, our ability to control disease will get stronger and stronger. Um, look at what we've done with HIV, for example. We took a deadly disease. Uh, and we turned it into a chronic disease. Um, there's some the new research that's coming out that allows us to um, diagnose cancers before patients are symptomatic very, very early um, in, the, in the cancer cycle. Hepatitis C, we found the cure for. And that's what the 21st century is going to look like. More and more, uh, we'll have that ability to uh, control health outcomes. A lot of it is going to be associated with our ability to generalize, to provide those therapies across uh, populations and making sure uh, that no one gets um, left, left behind. And um, from the African-American lens, I'm just going to um, uh, talk about that uh, for, two, for two seconds, because sometimes I think it gets lost about um, the journey that um, African-Americans uh, have been on. So, in effect, our ability to control our lives, essentially, um, I sort of uh, put the pin in the, in the map at, at uh, 1965 with the, uh, with the civil rights legislation and the ability to fully participate um, in, in the national conversation. I mean, that's, that's a generation. That's, that's, that's not, in the history of a people, that's a moment. That, that's like one second. Um, uh, when I talk to my Chinese friends, they say, yeah, our culture is 2,000, 3,000 years old compared to, uh, compared to here. And, and, and um, what that means is for the first time, we get to d decide who we are, what our communities look like, what future do we want, how do we want to raise our children, all of those kinds of questions. And healthcare is part of that dialogue. Others will think about it in terms of education and business, uh, but here we're, we're focused on, on um, on, on health. And as we can see with the, with the COVID virus, we have a long way to go. It sort of exposed what W.E.B. Du Bois was telling us back in 1905 that there would be disparities um, in, in, uh, in health and in health care uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for African Americans. But COVID for this generation um, has certainly um, made it apparent. Uh, and um, and what we're seeing, this great study that just came out um, um, uh, from the UK, uh, in which they were controlling for diabetes and hypertension and all those chronic diseases, as well as um, income. 
And blacks in the UK, these would be Africans and, and people from the Caribbean, still had a fourfold death rate, fourfold death rate uh, from, from the virus. So there's something deeper going on in the virus that, um, uh, that we, we need to pay attention to. But what COVID also teaches us, one, science is important. The way in which we're going to be able to affect this of disease is, is, is through science. Um, and in that science, um, that we can learn how to control that virus. Um, now, some of us are disappointed that the virus has reached the stage that it has in this country uh, because we didn't um, provide good um, interventions and good science um, in, its, in its management, and we're paying the price for that. Uh, but it's also opened the door for us to have a conversation about how do we manage healthcare in the future to make sure uh, that uh, we're reducing the risk. And so inside that controlling health outcomes and the thought uh, that I'll uh, leave you with and then we can, we can have um, the, the conversation is that the National Minority Quality Forum, what we think about is reducing patient risk, reducing everybody's risk. What you want your healthcare system to do is to reduce your risk for hospitalization, reduce your risk for emergency room visit, disability, mortality, while improving the quality of your life. And when you start to look at it within that framework, uh, what you understand is, in, in effect, um, becomes a math problem. Um, because what elevates your risk and what um, decelerates that risk are, are things that you can learn and know. Uh, and so, uh, what we're trying to do here at the National Minority Quality Forum is to gather the data, get it analyzed, and then be able to communicate out. Um, so here is the way how we can build sustainable, healthy communities, which is what um, everyone before us was anxious to do, but now we have that, that chance to do, um, and, and by using good policy and, and good science. So I'm excited um, to, to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation with Mia and, and the rest of you. So thank, thanks a lot. Well, I hope you all were taking notes as Dr. Parker was opening up. I, I most certainly was. And I want to just um, pick, pick up a lot of the places that you, you, you know, a lot of the things that you put down, Dr. Parker, and ask that you expound on that a bit, right? So, Essentially what you're doing for us right now, what you opened up with is a reimagining of our consideration of healthcare, the role of healthcare, of our, our, our beingness in terms of, in terms of wellness, um, and our abilities to, in a lot of ways, practice what I hear you saying is a sovereignty of, of, of health. And so I'm wondering, you know, you took us back to, you, you asked us to really keep in mind what happened, um, earlier in the 20th century and even before then, um, in terms of epidemiological trans uh, transitions, right? Where we move from, uh, from periods of infectious diseases, right? And, and anything, from, um, anything from smallpox to the flu and all of that to cholera. And now we are in this period of chronic disease, right? Where we can even consider um, conditions such as HIV as a chronic condition, whereas not long ago, within certainly within my lifetime, where it was very much considered a stigmatized um, infectious disease that required a different level of management. Um, and, and not only that, there was a, a sense that one was out of control um, with being able to really care for themselves and being empowered through the science, through the policy, um, with respect to diseases that were considered, you know, highly infectious. Um, but now we are at this moment of moving back to, in a lot of ways, from chronic management, or at least in COVID, you know, COVID itself is infectious, highly infectious disease, or, or virus rather. And we're thinking about leveraging this moment to help us think through what it needs to look like moving forward, right? So what does this I guess what I'm asking you is, what does this transition mean in the period of precision medicine, in the period of uh, biotherapeutics um, being developed, 
Um, and from a period of, to use your words, no one gets left behind in the medicine, you know, and, and controlling health outcomes and reducing patient risk. What does this moment mean in the grand scheme of history from, uh, in terms of epidemiological transitions? Yeah. So, so there's a convergence going on um, that is creating a paradigm shift. So some of the convergence is um, America is browning. Uh, so if we look back at the 20th century, um, the healthcare system would not have been designed to take care of, of people of, of color, uh, or even women for that, for that matter. It, 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 it was um, oriented around white males. If you think of clinical trials and things like that, I mean, that that's the way the, the, the system was structured. And, and it, was, it, it, was, it was kind of the norm. Everybody sort of thought that thought that way. So, so, you've got, so you've got that transition, but that transition is also bringing with it policy because um, the, these emerging communities um, have the, the power to vote and um, they're uh, looking for uh, representatives who are going to um, uh, look out for their interests in terms of, in this case, um, healthcare. So you, you've got that going on. Um, you also have uh, a scientific revolution going on. And the, the example that I would use, and you guys are young, so you may not uh, appreciate this as much, um, but go back and look at a hospital scene in the 1950s. Really, just turn it on and look at the technology around the, the bedside. The technology around the bedside was a pan of water and a sponge, right? Uh, because we didn't know. We we had we, we didn't have that science to intervene. And today we're operating at the genome level. We're talking about going in and altering the book of life so that we can cure sickle cell disease or uh, or forms of blindness or I mean it, it's just stunning um, what we're doing at, at the level of science and the capacity uh, that we're generating. Uh, the, the the problem is. Um, that uh, all, all of that technology um, is, is not being met by a, an innovative finance and delivery system. Uh, that system is still modeled um, uh, in the 20th century and it's still doing 20th century stuff uh, in terms of its ability uh, to provide optimal care for diverse populations. So it has to be reformed and the pressures of reform will come uh, because you've got this changing body politic, if you will, um, that um, is um, uh, going, to, going to demand so. And then finally, um, uh, the, the other very important part of, of is, is the environment, right? I think of COVID as, as, as an environmental factor um, that we let get out of control and it has us hiding in our houses, uh, you know, running, right? When we should be mastering that, that virus, it, it should never have gotten to this point. It's, it's like crazy um, that, that, that we've allowed that uh, to happen. But the environment is changing as well. COVID is not the only thing um, that, that's going on. Again, if you look back in history, particularly in this country, 17th and 18th century, uh, the U.S. was a vast open land of forests. I mean, there weren't any people. Um, and, and so how we treated the environment, we were a negligible impact. Uh, on the environment. We're not that anymore. Um, we, we, we have to now manage our relationship with the environment. And what I, would, what I would argue is we have to build an economy that's allowed, that aligns with our biology, right? That um, the economy has to be in the service of our biology and not in the service of itself. People think that um, of the economy is the be all and end all, uh, and whatever is good for the economy will necessarily uh, be good for everyone. But that, but that's that's not the case. So when you have this broad convergence coming together, it's going to bring um, all kinds of changes, and that's what our challenge is: is to manage those changes so that at the other side of it, we end up with sustainable, healthy communities. Uh, where uh, we pass on to the next generation um, a, a way of life that's recognizable to recognizable in the sense of of safety and efficacy and all that, 
uh, that we grew up with. So how, how, okay, so you laid out, you know, we need good, good policy, we need good science, good environment, right? Those are, those are the, the three uh, implications for managing this, this moment in crisis, right? But what does, what does it mean to, uh, to your point, what does it mean to manage all of that? What does it mean to manage these convergences, you know? So, so let, let's, let's um, leave the theoretical and let's get down to, to practicalities. So if anybody's been listening to any of the epidemiology, Fauci and, 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 and some of the others, um, what they're warning is that of uh, this um, fall and winter, the combination of the flu and of uh, the COVID vi virus um, are going to potentially have a devastating impact um, on, our, on our populations. And one would assume that um, the risk will be um, 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 higher in, in minority populations. So as a matter of, of just being smart right now, we got to get our folks vaccinated for the flu, right? And when you look at the data, minority populations have not been vaccinated uh, uh, for the flu. About 30% of, of minority seniors get the flu vaccine. It's even lower uh, for, um, for um, um, uh, uh, adults um, who, are, who are not retired. Um, so we have to, we have to, set policy right now uh, to make sure the flu season starts in August, so we've got a couple of months here, um, to make sure that all hands are on deck um, and whatever people imagine about the flu, whatever they heard their grandparents say or think about it, uh, what the science says is that we got to get folks vaccinated as, as a matter of urgency. There, there are lots of things like that um, where um, in, in practical terms, we can harden our communities um, as we um, try to get that, um, that coordinated leadership um, that we need in order to uh, reduce that, that risk um, that's sitting in front of us. And, and you bring up a really good point in terms of really leveraging the practicality of the science to ensure the policy expand, uh, well, the policy provides provisions to expand access to vaccinations to expand messaging um, into populations and communities that w that haven't heard a narrative um, as urgent as now around vaccines. But when you converge the science with the with the with the social reality, which is that a lot of people, especially mar marginalized and minoritized people and people who have historically been medically underserved, these are people who are less likely to trust the science. Um, and, and not so much that the science itself is shaky, but don't necessarily trust the the uh, the truth, the bearers of the of the science, right? The the messengers. And so, how is it that you know, getting back to managing these convergences um, on a practical level, how do you then deal with the complexities of um, social realities, which are often steeped in histories and generations of of mistrust? That, that's why we need folks like you, Mia. Um, uh, Fauci's great. Uh, we love him. Um, but uh, we need diverse voices um, speaking as well and people down at the community level uh, using, using their voice. Um, um, you know, that, that in a way, that's part of the old system, right? The, um, the, the, the face of science and messaging um, was not as diverse as it needs to be in order to make sure um, that the message is heard, um, sometimes the messenger is as important as the message. Uh, and so um, we uh, who know um, have to figure out how do we um, uh, uh, help inform our community um, what the science is and, and how to, it, it'll, it'll be incredibly difficult. I live here in Washington, D.C. Um, I see young um, black males um, who are not social distancing, who are not wearing masks, um, who are, are you know, essentially flaunting the science, even though there's this extraordinary risk of this virus in our population, and, and they have the probability of taking that home to their parents, 
uh, to their grandparents and 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 uh, and, and, uh, and other relatives, um, and and you know you sit there and you say to yourself, so how how do we communicate? How do we get that message across? Uh, because in order for us to 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 manage that risk in our community, um, we 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 all have to be on deck. We all have to understand um, what that probability is. Because I think if you walked up to those um, young black males and said, for the most part, um, uh, do you want to put your grandparents at, at risk? Um, um, they, they would say no. Um, and, um, and, and it opens the conversation up to trying to do something. Yeah, you know, I, th I think uh, you're getting at a number of things here, right? Um, you're, you're, you're getting at individual level responsibility and accountability, but then also seeing oneself in the larger narrative of, of American well-being, right? And so I love what you said about flaunting in the face of science. Um, I know that we all know, or, are, or, in, or if we don't directly know, we know somebody who knows that for Calcutrin young man or, or woman who is just like, it's, you know, it's about me, I take care of myself, there's, there's nothing that uh, the government can, will really do in terms of sticking their neck out on behalf of me, so I'm going to take care of myself. So there's that level of skepticism. There's that level also of fear. In a lot of ways, it's, it's very much, um, even though it comes off as, as rebellious in a lot of ways, um, that is also very much an expression of fear. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention that your conversation is bringing to mind is the significance of the public health leadership and workforce, right? So um, what, what this moment, what COVID is really uh, exposing in addition to the, um, the disparities that existed prior to COVID is the fact that you're right, we, it, is, it is very difficult to have, well, not to have, it has just been a long time coming since we've had a large cadre of public health leaders who are um, not only have um, access to certain tables and conversations, but they also have the ear to the ground and people trust them with respect to the messages that they can deliver. So how can we meld, Dr. Parker, and how can we meld the fact that, yes, we need, we need this precise scientific approach, right? We need to be very mindful of, um, of thinking in terms of health outcomes and, and systems level change uh, moving forward. But how can we also ensure that we are building pipelines or, or leveraging policy, leveraging the science, leveraging the environment to create opportunities for these diverse voices to thrive and rise to the top and hold place, hold court um, for the American people? So uh, the question you're asking is, is really um, the, the deep question and, and the and, and, and the challenge because um, it, it, it is not um, that you have a blank slate um, sitting in front of you where you can uh, begin to write and, and do so um, knowing that of uh, this complete support around what it is you want to you want to try to accomplish. Um, there are there's a whole legacy uh, out there uh, that sees the world um, differently. And so, um, and, that, and that's the beauty and power of a democracy, um, is that you know um, you have to come together, um, and um, uh, through persuasion and other resources to make sure um, that um, um, everyone recognizes that there's a collaboration, there's a deep collaboration that goes on um, across race and ethnic lines. Um, that um, in, empower a, a country uh, to to be successful as well as to uh, take care of its uh, of its population, uh, and you know again I'm going to speak a little bit through the African American lens. Um, we, we've seen the other the underside of of, of the world in which uh, we were essentially commercial objects. Um, when um, um, our value wasn't in our life, it was in our in our work product. Um, that um, and and um, our life was expendable in, in terms of in terms of the in terms of the work product. But I think that history 
um, is important to communicate. It 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 it, it um, um, uh, helps people should help people understand um, that um, uh, in in your society, uh, prioritizing um, uh, health and conserving life um, is the priority of the system. Um, it's, it's not the economy that's the priority of the system. Um, and, and, and so getting people to um, um, organize around that understanding that um, if you look at this virus, for the two and a half months, it's almost killed 100,000 people. Um, uh, it gives you a signal of how dangerous um, the world actually is. And um, what we don't want is a repeat of that, uh, either with this virus or any other virus. But, um, you know, if you go to the chronic diseases of diabetes and heart failure and cancer, um, you know, the, the, they're not as dramatic in the sense of, of the, um, the, the rate at which uh, they uh, take life. But, you know, in effect, um, th that's what they do. And so um, uh, it, it is our ability to come together collaboratively to address those issues, I think is what the 21st century is about. The 20th century couldn't do it. They couldn't even imagine uh, what we're talking about. They, they just didn't have, they didn't have the understanding, uh, right? They were, um, they, they were in what I would just call, describe as a random world. They lived as long as the odds were, were with them. Uh, but here we're talking about controlling the odds. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's unique and different. And I think um, uh, diverse populations have a very important role um, uh, to play in the design of that new, new economy. You know, I, I truly appreciate you making that uh, distinction in terms of um, society's ability to imagine or reimagine the future between, you know, the 20th century and the 21st century. And earlier in the conversation, you um, you reference W.E.B. Du Bois, and, and one of, um, one, you know, and a lot of people know this, this quote, uh, you know, he said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, right? And he laid that out in, in the souls of black folk, which if you all have not read, um, audience members, you absolutely, before you leave this earth, need to read all things written by W.E.B. Du, Bo uh, du Bois, probably the first man, um, uh, medical sociologist for certain, um, but also one of the best imagine uh, one of the best imaginations that we've ever had in, uh, on this on this planet. Um, but anyhow, so he said the the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the 20 of, of the color line. What I would also extend is that the problem of the 21st century is the problem of the color line. And where we're where we're seeing this, you know, it, it certainly comes out in terms of disease and outcomes. But Dr. Parker, you're talking to us about precision medicine, you're talking to us about reframing the conversation from disparities to uh, a more futuristic, and, not, and by futuristic, I mean like today, tomorrow, of, of leveraging biotechnologies, therapies, um, precision medicine to really get deeper at, the, at biological differences, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of, of health outcomes. But again, if you map on, the complexities of social constructs around racism, or excuse me, around race, around class, and and I and I actually that wasn't a Freudian slip. It is more so racism as opposed to, as opposed to uh, to race, um, but experiences of racism in the way that they it bears on the body uh, and and changes the genome in a lot of ways. And we know that because of science. And I know I'm jumping around. I'm going to come back to the question, but we know that in terms of um, the ways in which people of color in the U.S. experience race racism rather. Um, it bears on uh, their, their telomeres. There's a study out on, on, on black men and, and, and the shortening of their telomeres. And, you know, telomeres are essentially the, the component of the, the cell that, um, that, speeds, uh, uh, that, that spreads nutrients throughout the body, um, but it also relates to aging. Um, and they're shortened telomeres amongst black men in the U.S., which differs from any other person walking um, this earth. And I bring that up to say, if it's not, Dr. Puckin, if it's not about disparities anymore, um, at, yet we're still dealing with the complexities of the color line, isn't it safe to say that the new frontier of disparities or inequity 
would still be precision medicine, would still be biotechnologies, would still be biotherapies, if we do not have some frame of, some framing, some centering of equity within that conversation? Yeah. So the way I'd answer, answer you is this. Um, so there's still people who believe that the earth is flat. There's a flat earth society out there. And one of the things um, that I've come to appreciate is once you introduce an idea into a, into a society, eliminating that idea is doggone near impossible. But you're always going to find some folks who, for whatever reason, are going to, going to subscribe to it. Uh, unfortunately for this country, and, and I would say for the world, really, um, because um, the whole idea of race uh, is, is really happened in the Western Hemisphere, um, uh, particularly the U.S., um, played a very important role um, in, in creating that, that sense of I identity. Um, it's it's going to be hard to remove. Um, and I, I think the way to, to, to kind of um, get at this is, is really um, through practical applications. Um, we need to make sure um, in our policies, whatever small elements in the society or significant elements in the society believe, um, we cannot put uh, any population at risk. Um, we cannot uh, ignore um, that risk. Uh, one of the things that I find amazing when I look at the data that you wouldn't think about in, in this country, you know, parts of this country, the life expectancy from birth is 59 years. I mean, it's 59 years, we're in the 21st century, and we have Americans who, when they're born, they're expected to live to, to age 59. And, and, they, and they, they exist in both Republican and Democrat uh, districts, in, in, in independent of race. Um, and we have to say that, well, that's inappropriate, right? Um, we, 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 we have to marshal ourselves to do that. And that takes investment, right? That takes resources and, and, um, to do. And that's why I'm making the point that um, the economy has to serve our biology. That um, if you start to say that we can't afford to take care of this group of people, right? Um, um, because we've decided we want to spend our money someplace else, right? What you're in effect saying is I'm going to elevate their risk. I'm going to make it look like the 20th century or the 19th century for them because I'm going to withhold all of the science and other things that we know that we have the capacity uh, to provide care. And, and th that's the point I'm making. And um, uh, if we focus on the practicalities, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to say that uh, the idea of race is ever going to disappear um, out of our society because it's baked in the cake now and uh, it's gonna be very, very difficult uh, uh, to remove. Uh, but that should not inform policy. That should not mean that somebody's life is going to be deformed by, by that historic reality. So um, let's, let's go back to, to what you said, Dr. Puckren, about the economy having to really uh, meet our biology, right? And we know that the economy is striated uh, across uh, where people land in terms of education, um, level of education. Um, the economy is driven by, um, by opportunities in terms of career paths and, and, and job security, right? So to your point about making sure policy is used to reduce risk and a lot of people given, his, you know, given the history of um, you know, racialized policies, um, in the U.S., how do we reimagine policy today to take in, into account um, the needs that we all have, and the socially determinate needs, you know, to meet the economy, to have the economy to meet our biological needs? Um, so, um, access to quality health care does not necessarily need to follow your degree um, or what work you do, or how well you speak the English language, or um, you know, sexual orientation. Those are all things that we decided to, um, uh, to make valuable 
um, as we dispense healthcare. Um, and I'm basically saying that um, that's inappropriate, right? That, um, and, and speaking of history, if you go back to the founding creed, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, actually what Jefferson wrote was preservation of life, liberty, and happiness. Those were the fundamental principles upon which the society was built. And the idea was you entered into the social contract because um, the system was going to help you preserve your life, make sure that you had maximum amount of freedom without interfering with someone else, and that you could pursue your, your own version of, of happiness. It didn't say, I needed you to go to Harvard. It didn't say that you, you got to um, have a million dollars. Uh, it didn't even say that you had to be of a particular race. And that, that was sort of the conflict that the founding fathers had because what it said was all human beings um, uh, uh, were, were entitled uh, to those things. And we just need to operationalize uh, what we committed ourselves to way back in, in 1776. So how then can people do that? And, you know, day to day, people are trying to live their lives, you know, in this moment of COVID, people are trying to think about, you know, which store do I go to to get toilet paper? You know, um, what time can I can I go somewhere to, um, you know, to get groceries such that I'm not completely exposed to to the to the virus. Right. So in all of these things that are taking really people are just trying to survive. Right. So how how can we, in terms of those who are on the call and, and us within our spheres of influence amongst our families, in our workplace, in our places of worship, how is it that we can help communicate this very important point that you're making, which is, you know, we have the ability to decide what we need to be happy, but don't always have the ability to access those things to contribute to our happy, to our wellness and our happiness. So the, the core idea was the vote. Um, you're supposed to, um, it, it, the, the theory was that you're going to vote for your self-interest, mm -hmm. that you're going to vote for people who are going to manage the society in order to make sure that you have the ability to realize those things. The reason why you're not doing it right now is because we haven't managed it very well, right? And, and because we've not managed very well, 100,000 people are dead. 33 million people are unemployed. I mean, come on. Um, that's what government's job is. That's, that's, that's the essential principle of government. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the, the point is, um, you're supposed to make a very solemn and important decision when you elect someone to represent your interest. <laughs> your expectation is that they're going to put policies in place that preserve your life. They're going to give you maximum amount of liberty, they're going to give you the space so that you can pursue your own version of, of, of happiness. That's what democracy is. That's, that's essentially the system um, that the founding fathers envisioned. Uh, and the, the fact that you say people are now trying to survive, that's the state of nature. That's, mm -hmm. that's what we were trying to get away from. Mm -hmm. Each individual out there in, in, in the frontier fending for themselves and beating off everybody else so that they could take care of their family. Uh, the modern day version of it is, you know, of standing in, in, in bread lines and no, that's not, that's not the system um, that anybody um, imagined. Um, and, and so um, the responsibility is to vote, right? That, that's your job. Um, and once you do that, if you find the person is not a good manager, is not capable of doing it, and you vote them out. You vote somebody out. I mean, you know, that, that's how I'm we do it. I'm, I'm with you on that, you know, and I, and I think, I mean, we can, it's, it's interesting to watch ourselves in this moment in terms of how we interact um, with each other in spaces, in public spaces, right, where we're being cautioned by science to say, keep away from each other. How does that translate in terms of, and this is more of a rhetorical question for everyone, how does the science 
the, the, the rhetoric of the science uh, in terms of physical distancing really determine how we interact with each other, but beyond that, how we value one another, um, and on the civic level, how we view shared interest, right? Um, if it is in my best interest when I go to the grocery store, and I'm going to, I'm going to scale this up to, to what you're saying in terms of voting, if it's in my best interest in the grocery store to secure toilet paper, it's me and one other person in the aisle. There's one pack of toilet paper. It is in my best interest to secure this toilet paper for me, right? Yeah. It is really hard to also then say to someone else, I value you. I share your interest of wanting to keep a, a clean behind, but it's in my better interest for me to have this, this piece of paper, right? Um, that is the same thing that, that's happening. You know, it's not a stretch to, to, to scale that up to what's happening in terms of our, our, uh, the policies that, that we might say are one, one is more important than the other. Um, because certain interests are, are, all interests are value laden, right? All policies are value laden. So how is it in our civic engagement as individuals, but then also as collectives, because each of us are coming um, into, we, we all represent collective bodies, whether those bodies have to do with our, the companies where we work, our identities, um, what, whatever salient identity we put forth, maybe you're a part of um, an organization that uh, bases values and interests on your sexual orientation, on your racial identity, so on and so forth. But how can we see each other more collectively so that we all share this paper? So, you know, um, I guess the point I would make is, um, so you never want to put people in that situation where they have to make that choice, mm -hmm. um, be it um, for toilet paper or at, at, the, at, at anything, anything larger, uh, because at, at, at that level, instinct will have to uh, kick in and self-preservation uh, will be, that, that's what the state, state of nature was. And that's what, um, um, you know, Jefferson and all those folks were talking about, which is if we, agree to collaborate, we can avoid putting ourselves in that state of nature where we have to preserve our interests. That, I mean, that's where our biology kicks in and we have to conserve ourselves and our family. Uh, and so it is the responsibility of the people that we elect um, and they choose uh, the other managers um, to make sure that the system um, doesn't put us um, in those in those circumstances, and it's really critical because, um, it, it, particularly in a multiracial, multicultural society, they can fracture easily um, if you uh, put them under that kind of stress, right? Um, because um, you know people people will norm to the tribe, if you will. And so you got to keep them. You got to be aware of 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 that um, uh, that risk inside your your social order uh, that um, you're bringing many voices together. Um, and so, in order to make sure that it doesn't fracture and 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 people um, get down to the least common denominator, uh, that um, you're, you're managing the system well um, and. Um, and you, you're also anticipating um, that that leadership is not going to prey on that. Um, one of the great um, things to, to read, speaking of reading, the book called Black Jacobin, it's about mm -hmm. uh, um, rebellion. Um, and it, it was broken out on, on racial lines, uh, but um, each group, depending on what the need was, collaborated uh, with, uh, with another racial group uh, to the disadvantage of, uh, of uh, another group. Um, I mean, so there are a lot of history lessons here um, that, um, that you know, give us clear signals in this case. So in these last moments, Dr. Puffer, and I wanted to, uh, that's, that's funny. My, um, let me grab my water here. In these last moments, I, I, want, I want you to help us to tie together all of the important points that you've made, right? So you're talking to us about 
excuse me, you're talking to us about moving the conversation away from the framing of disparities solely, right? Which, which keeps us in, and the, the, the framing of disparities is important, of inequities is important because it helps us, it, it, a lot of people aren't at that recognition stage that there are differences, right? And that these differences are avoidable and they're avoidable by leveraging the three components you mentioned, which is good science, good policy, and good environment toward the reduction of overall patient risk, of overall health and wellness um, for the American people, including people who historically have been marginalized and minoritized, right? Yeah. So as we're moving forward into this more high-tech society where, to your point, it's no longer um, a, a sponge and a pan at the bedside, but now we're getting more at the genomic level, how is it, how do you think our policies moving forward are keeping abreast of the shared values and collectivity um, that a lot of people have already recognized because they're willing to engage and raise their consciousness around um, recognized differences in terms of, of health? And then also, can you answer that in terms of the COVID moment and, and beyond? So part of it is, and one of the reasons why I enjoy so much having these conversations with you. Uh, and uh, we do a program called 40 Under 40. We have a lot of uh, our 40 Under 40 folks because they're the next generation. And I'm really uh, in part talking to them and helping mm -hmm. them uh, think, about, um, think about the future. Part of the challenge we, we have right now is um, our leadership is still in the 20th century. They're still That's thinking right. about it in, in 20th century terms. Um, and they, they're trying to recreate the 1950s. Uh, and it's not, it's not possible. Um, and they're doing a lot of damage of doing it, but that, that's sort of where their heads are, uh, that they think that um, the, the, the America of the 1950s um, is, is, is the ideal. And, and they can find 30% of the American population who, who, um, who, who go along with them. Um, the point about of controlling health outcomes is not to ignore disparities. Um, uh, it, it is saying that um, every, every life is unique and different, um, and uh, we need to work hard to conserve that life, and we don't need to measure it against someone else's life in the sense of, of standardizing the health of African Americans and Hispanics against the health of whites or Asians or anybody else, um, that um, what we should be doing together is pushing the frontier. Um, and in pushing that frontier, making sure that the new um, science, technology, devices, medicines uh, that come along um, are uh, available to everyone. Um, that um, in effect, we don't make the decision to value some lives um, uh, more than others, that's not the deal. That's, that's not our contract. Um, our contract is that every life is equal and, and that uh, we need to work very hard for it. In, in, ter in terms of COVID, um, you know, part, part of the challenge right now is um, management-wise, we're, we're still a little fuzzy on, 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 on what we're doing. And so you got a lot of people running around doing a lot of different things. Uh, and we, we need to we need to bring some management um, over it and uh, state uh, what our what our goals are and and how do we put systems together to to achieve those goals. I mean, what essentially we're trying to do is balance the risk from the environment while making sure that uh, people have livelihoods and, and can take care of their family. Th that's what's on the table. Uh, to be managed, and I, and I think that's doable. I think there's, a, there's ways to think through that. We're clever enough, we can do that. Um, and, um, and so we need to use our voices um, to, to accomplish that, and that gets around to, you gotta vote. You know, at the end of the day, um, that's very fundamental. Um, you, you, gotta, you gotta do that, um, and not get caught up in um, the, the, the noise, right? Democracy is very noisy. Um, uh, part of the part of the, the mystery of democracy is uh, personal assassination of character and uh, you know uh, 
turning colors. Of, it is, it's not this generation that's doing it. It's been going on since 70, 76. Uh, there's a great book called The Paranoid Style in American Democracy. Uh, Richard Hofstede wrote a whole book about the paranoid style. Um, it's always been there because that's democracy. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it is a way of, of culling the group and building group identity, but you, you got to be smart enough to keep your eye on the ball, uh, which is who can manage um, uh, to make sure that I don't have to stand in line for toilet paper, that when I send my kid to school, I don't have to be afraid um, that they're going to come home and infect uh, my, 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 my mother and my, my aunt and uncle, uh, and then I can get up in the morning and safely go to work. Those are the things that you got to stay focused on and all that other noise um, you just write off as you know, what democracy does. Uh, you know, and so I, I appreciate what you what you just outlined. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of my conversations with friends who who are not people of color, um, and particularly my my friends who are white women. You know, a lot of them have great intentions and can wax poetic about our policymakers and our administration and things like that. One thing that I challenge them with and what I challenge our audience with is you can hold two thoughts in your head about um, uh, about who we are as a people and what we need. You can hold the thought in your head that to your point, Dr. Puckerman, we all are um, equally valuable and we need to hold each other in a space of shared interest because we recognize we are equally of value to our society at large. Um, and uh, to a more localized extent to our communities and to our families and friends, right? You can hold that thought. The other thought that we have to maintain and a lot of people are still very uncomfortable with is the point that while we are equally valued and we should maintain that, our needs are not the same right now in this moment. Um, in the moment of COVID and, and, and then also just in the moment of where we stand in the history of the world. With respect to COVID, um, the, the, the toll on Native Americans and First Nation peoples is outrageous. Um, the uninsured rate for Latinx member, uh, members of our community um, are just deplorable. The, the, um, the unemployment rate as a result of COVID amongst, amongst Black people, um, especially because so many Black people Occupy spaces of um, of uh, service occupations, right? Is 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 just downright. It's it's it is unfair, right? Um, and it is very sad. But it just goes to show what you were saying before that a lot of where we are now is a result of where we've come from. And so moving forward, yeah, we need to we need to keep in mind all of us are, are equal and we're all equally valuable and that needs to be reflected in the science um, with respect to um, precision medicine and biotherapies. It needs to be reflected in our policy because like to your point, it's not in our contract to consider anything else. But those, the science and the policies need to have managers, to your point about management, who understand that duality of yes, we're all equal, yes, we, we, we value one another, at the same time, there are inequities in terms of our needs. Therefore, our policies need to have policy members who can well manage um, that, that thought. Our scientists, we need greater pathways to uh, increase opportunities for black and brown people at the bench, right? Um, and so there need to be appropriations set aside and authorizations in the policies to make sure that that happens. And at the same time, recognizing this doesn't mean we're, we're doing something special for people. We are all equal, yet our experiences are not, right? To, to manage that risk. Yeah, and that, that's really um, the, the difficult part and, and the challenging part that um, elected officials and managers um, have, to, have to come to grips with, uh, which is um, how do we, um, um, so there were built-in inequities in the old economy. Um, it, it, that's the way it functioned. Um, it, it was a transferring wealth around, and, and it created um, those those inequities. Uh, and you know, 
part of what's happening, and this goes back to that shift in the policy world, um, as, as that, um, as that uh, group who before um, did not have access to the ballot, um, whose voices were uh, uh, attenuated when it came to policy, um, they're, they're, now, they're now at the table. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you, you can see and feel the stress, the stress of that. Um, what, what needs to uh, be clear is that this is not a zero sum game that um, as we um, try to bring all of our populations along, it doesn't mean that you're going to have less to feed your child with, or your child is going to be uh, denied something, or you're going to be denied something. Um, that um, we're, we're managing it to make sure to our principles, um, everybody is getting um, a fair um, access. It's not to say that everybody's got the same life um, and have the same capabilities, uh, but we're not going to punish you uh, by, de by denying you access to quality health care um, in this particular instance. Or when we see um, these COVID mortalities in the minority population that we're not going to aggressively try to do something about that. Um, and try to try to manage that uh, 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 with with, uh, uh, with with some urgency, and I think I think that's um, that that's the challenge that sits in front of us. Uh, um, yeah, that, that's the challenge that, that sits in front of us. But that's what good management is about. I mean, um, um, yeah, yeah, sure, you can elect someone who will say, "No, nah, you don't need to take care of the other guy. I'm just going to take care of you, and the world's going to be okay." Um, if uh, if you um, survive, but the instability um, that comes out of that um, doesn't doesn't work to anyone's advantage, and so um, I, I think we just have to be very very smart about what we're doing. We have to be smart about it, Dr. Parker, and as, as you've mentioned, and um, and keep in, keep this framework in mind as each of us in our own spaces evaluate the policies that are being birthed in this time of COVID, um, because. It's not just that they will impact us and our ability to exercise uh, wellness now, but there'll be law, you know, should they be um, enacted, and, and it'll impact uh, our, our families in future um, for some time to come, you know, so we've got just a minute left, and Dr. Parker, I really appreciate sitting down. I always appreciate talking, <laughs> talking with you, um, you know, and especially because I think we go, we go back and forth about oh, you need to read this book, you need to read that book. Um, you know, and I, I very much appreciate your, um, your dedication to learnedness, um, and even more so your dedication to passing that one to, to other people, passing um, the baton, if you will, in a lot of ways. And uh, you, make, you make future leadership and present burgeoning uh, public health leadership um, much stronger mm -hmm. with uh, the wisdom that you share. And thank you so very much for your message of reframing um, to think about ways, uh, health outcomes, and, and in addition to, uh, to, to disparity and, and such. So I appreciate you, sir. I hope you all enjoy, enjoy speaking with you, and it's always a lot of fun. And um, I, I hope others found some, some value in the conversation. So thank you again. Thank you. Brandon, we can't hear you. Oh, there we go. I think we're good now. Yeah, thank you both again. Uh, Mia, as always, every week you always come through with the great points and counterpoints and ask the questions that we all want to hear. And boss, I see you every day, so <laughs> <laughs> every day about these things and building sustainable, healthy communities. I appreciate that. Um, I think uh, in light of what you guys mentioned, I want to make sure that make plugs, make sure everybody votes and is registered to vote. And then that everyone also fills out their census forms. Yeah. Um, so just want Absolutely. to get that out there as well. So I think the next time we'll make, maybe we'll put a link in the comment section or an invitation or something just to make sure that everyone, we're doing our part to spread the word about voting and getting that census filled. So with that, everyone have a uh, great weekend. And I look forward to seeing you again next Friday. And finally, if you have your own topic ideas, and things you want to learn more about here is discuss, please feel free to email the uh, the invisible boss Keiko Purnell and she'll get that to us and we'll um, discuss it. So thanks a lot again guys and have a good weekend. Thank you. Stay safe all.